Welcome back to the channel guys. Hope you had a fantastic Christmas. Looking forward to the new year, I'm sure. I'm filming this just between Christmas and New Year. I was originally going to do a video that was kind of focused quite heavily on Tame. And that's just because I recently I had a breakthrough, kind of a coaching breakthrough in the dojo uh, with how I was able to kind of get somebody to really properly kind of deploy Tame. Right, so for those of you who don't know, Tame is this tension in the back leg that we talk about. Okay, so if you're taking Chudon no Kamae, yeah, you're in your Chudon. The idea is that you have a straight back leg, right? Straight angle. And the knee is not locked, okay? But you want to avoid this kind of bending of the knee, okay? And that's all fine and well if it looks like that and it's got a nice shape and all these kinds of things. But obviously you need to make practical use. So this person I was coaching is Nidan going on Sanda. They have, well, she has a repertoire of waza that are pretty good in Kihon, right? So when we're doing our drills, they're working pretty well. She's got a nice round repertoire of waza that she can use. The problem that we had is in Jikeko, we were having problems against various opponents with being able to deploy that, being able to practically deploy that under pressure, okay? So I'll come back to that in a second, but really this is what got me started thinking about it, okay? So Tommy is this tension in the back leg, so I want to make this video so that it's something that various different levels of people can kind of learn from, okay? Um, in case you don't know, I'm fourth down, I'm looking to take my fifth down in a few months, uh, literally in the next six months. And uh, so this is still stuff I'm working on, but if I can help anybody else on their journey from the very start of their kendo, uh, anywhere up to kind of in and around where I am, I will do my best to do so, okay? So that's where I'm coming from on this. Anyway, if you're a beginner, right, let's talk about this idea of tummy, this straight leg. If you're a beginner, you're told to stand in two down. You are told, yeah, hips square to the front. If your opponent's there, yeah, your hips are straight towards them, okay? That's the first thing. Tip of the shin line, Pointed at their solar plexus or throat, somewhere around there is usually acceptable. Yeah, and the shin is about what, fist and a half away from your navel, two fists maybe without the door. Okay, okay, shoulders back and down, but not leaning back. Okay, try to keep your shoulders, your head, and your hips in alignment and keep your left heel straight. Now, we're tall. Don't let your left heel, so I don't know if you can see that, don't let your left heel twist, okay? Okay, so from a beginner's perspective, why is this important, okay? So if you're somebody who's going through the Q grades, you want to get your first down, why is this important? What, what does it mean to you, okay? In Kendall, we need to be able to attack our opponent directly with commitment, okay? Something even if you're just doing big basic cuts, something along the lines of boom. Yeah. Okay. If you want a uh, you know, reasonably strong attack along those kind of things, these are the mechanics that you need to deploy. Okay. So, from this Chudan Nakamai shape, if your left leg, if the knee is buckled, right, there's a couple of problems that tend to creep in. Okay. And you can see this if you're someone who's coaching, you start to get this kind of S shape. Okay? Typically when people do this, their shoulders are a bit too far back too. And so it starts to look a bit like, like an S that way. Like that way. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of problems. What happens if you've got this bent knee? Well, two things. I've seen this, which is the down and up movement. Yeah, I've seen that. I've also seen the up and over, which technically, or, or most commonly, seems to come with food form. Yeah, or, so it sometimes go up before the strike, or as part of the strike. And, whoop, like this. In Kendall, you want to move straight to your opponent. So I don't want to take this trajectory through the air. I want to take journey straight to the target. Okay, shortest distance between two points is a straight line. 
that's what we're trying to achieve with our uh, fumikomayashi, the stamping footwork. That's why we do it the way we do. That's why we stand with our hips square on like that. Let's say you're beyond that point. Oh, I should mention, the left heel, that needs to be straight. Why, you may ask, if it's turned, okay, that's an extra movement, first off, to straighten it and then go, which you don't have time for, and it's going to give you blisters. Every time you twist like that, it's going to hurt your feet. Or, if you don't fix it, and you just have the twist, you're going to come in with this hip off alignment, okay? You might ask, what's the problem with that? Well, there's a couple of problems. First thing, it ruins your accuracy. So if you come in nice and straight, you can see the shin I wants to stay straight. Two, 200 weapon, right? If it's twisted, you can kind of see there's a tendency for it to come off to the right, okay? Or for it to overswing because you're trying to correct that. Now, it doesn't happen to everyone. Some people get pretty good at doing it that way, but it's not, it's not a great way to go about things. So try and iron it out early in your kendo, and then you won't have a big problem to try to fix later, right? So on a basic, basic level, this is tame. The tension in your leg, and it goes all the way through your leg, so it's not just in this knee area that everyone talks about, about having a straight knee but not locked. It's that, but it's also having that heel in alignment, and what I highly recommend with Ruchudo, just have a bit of tension in your butt cheek to support that leg. You'll be able to go straight forward, okay? Uh, also, a bit of tension in your belly helps with that. You'll uh, talk about, hear people talking about use, use your hara. And what they mean is just have a stable core so that you can drive without wobbling and without your hips kind of getting detached from you, okay? These are important things. So for that EQ to show down level, that's your basic idea of tame, right? And that's your basic idea of chudan kamai, the shape of the posture. And up to that level, that's okay. That's kind of what you're working on, right? Shodan to nidan, there's a transition that needs to start happening. You need to show that you not, you don't just have that shape. Yeah, and it's, you know, you're starting to show now that you have a bit of kind of dynamic um, uh, dynamics and fluidity about your kendo. Right, I'll try and show you what I mean. So, the typical shoulder training where people pass looks something like, even when on a bad day, it looks something like, yeah, step in, go through, turn, yeah, step in, go through, this kind of thing. That's not ideal, it's not really what you're looking to do. But a lot of people do that and they still pass the grading because they showed Kikyan Tainoichi, posture was reasonable. Um, they were able to drive off and do reasonable uh, Fumikomi, which means that they could do reasonable Fumikiri. Fumikiri is the pushing off the back leg. Yeah, it's this movement. That movement, that pushing off, the driving off, that's Fumikiri. You can't really do Fumikomi without some degree of Fumikiri. Okay, so. You've got yourself to that point. You're now starting to get to a point where you move on from shoulder where it's like now you are, you know, you have all the basic shapes, you have the basic moves down. And now it's time to start learning kendo, right? <laughs> so, okay, that's the expression in kendo. Once you get shoulder, you're, you're actually just, now you're ready to start. <laughs> okay, so, need a level kendo. Now, what starts to tend to happen is start learning to shorten the waza. You can do this earlier. If you have strong kick and tie, you, do, you can do small cuts, big cuts, that doesn't really matter so much. For practicality's sake, especially in Shi'ai, you need the small waza. Okay, so just clarifying now, I'm not saying everything should be big key hog all of the time. I'm just saying what it, most people typically see at gradings, at least here in the West. Um, for Nina, things naturally start to shorten down. Uh, people are, tend to predominantly use small waza and in order to do that your balance and your use of kamai needs to have improved so start to see this kind of thing typically people get a bit more active there's a little, maybe a little bit of shinai work involved yeah, in that connection yeah, and the 
tends to be one cell that there's more, maybe more than one, right? Kind of, it can just be semi <laughs> It can just be that, but you also see a lot more of yeah, this kind of thing. And you start to see some people will use if you want them. Okay. And sometimes you get the grading advice from people. Oh, you should do knee down waza, you should do two step waza uh, for your knee down grading. <laughs> Which is a bit of a misnomer because you don't need to at all. But it's not so much what waza you're using, it's what those waza, if you can do them reasonably well at that level, it's what they actually show the panel. That's why people suggest to use it. What they show the panel is that you've taken your posture and you've improved it to the point where you can attack in succession and sustain your balance better throughout the entire encounter. So it becomes, for talk's sake, the difference between shodan, but maybe we semi, and then everything kind of stops typically. And then they decide to go, and then everything stops. Yeah, everything stops and then they readjust, they get to pull my, and then send it and it stops, and then they go. Okay. Even if it's small as well. Yeah. Send me, stop. Yeah. There tends to be these big breaks in the in the candle. Strike, stop, send me, stop, turn, stop. Okay. Need on this this stops they're still there, but they're smaller in the context. So it becomes, yeah, now this posture is dynamic, this chudo is kind of moving around a lot. Yeah, they're trying to do some different things, and they're trying to use the shinai bit to generate a bit of pressure, a bit of connection with the opponent. Yeah, and then for the attacks, it might just be something very simple, like yeah. But you show that improved balance of Fumikiri, yeah, Fumikiri again, Fumikomi, and Hiketsuke. Hiketsuke is that, that, drawing your left foot up, back into position so you're ready to strike again. This is important, okay? And it's something you should really focus on for Nidan. And that's why the smaller waza and the Nidan waza is important to practice. And it can just be it doesn't have to be two strikes. Yeah, it could be seme, harai, harai, harai me, harai kote, seme, harai. This is okay. <laughs> this shows that there's a bit of that fluidity, a bit more dynamics, okay? What well, inevitably what happens from that need on level, trying to progress beyond that, is that things, if left unchecked, become a bit contrived and a bit bouncy, for lack of a better word, yeah? And you start kind of bouncing around for no reason, yeah? So this, it's all fine and well to keep moving. It's often said during Shi'ai that if you stop your footwork, you'll be struck, okay? That's how you'll lose. So by all means, you use the space, this is fine. But sometimes it goes a bit beyond that, for that level. People start to kind of do this kind of nonsense, right? jumping around. Okay. Here's a really important point, and it dials back to this basic idea of Tame, and your fundamental idea of Kamai, and Migamai, right? Migamai is your control of your body, that posture, okay? Every time you move that back foot, and it's between A and B, yeah? So if it's left, yeah, and from here to here, in that moment where I lift it, or it's back, yeah, or even forward, or like there, or to the right. Every time that foot is off the ground, you can't use it to strike. So be wary of bouncing. Especially this. Nothing annoys me more, to be honest, than this. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. With all due respect to everybody doing the kendo, but it's true. Every time you do that, there's no point doing the highest degree in the shiaijo. 
That's not the time or place for it. Okay. <laughs> Every time that back foot is off the ground, you can't use it. Okay. So be aware of that. That doesn't mean you can't move it. It means you need to move it with purpose. So what starts to happen from the kind of third down to fourth down transition is people start to have a bit more confidence in their posture, a bit more confidence in their, depend, in their defense. Yeah. So this isn't just for show. Yeah. So one of the things you need to realize, yeah, like I said, if you move this all the time, you get hit. So what starts to happen is this semi where the right foot is coming forward, that tension in the left leg remains. So maybe it's uh, something like this, where you just semi like that, right? And you're setting up a man, right? You hope that they will move in response to that. You should be able to strike instantly because you kept that tension in your back leg and you kept your kind of mind, your mental connection to your leg, right? You're committed to that attack. Yeah, maybe the semi is like this, like an invite, right? Invite for men. And as soon as you know that they're going for that man, yeah, they caught it, maybe, okay? But the same thing applies. So, you might get less of this. You might still get a bit of side to side, right? So maybe the, your idea is to semi this way and kind of push towards their corte, yeah? And you hope that they will try to take a corte for themselves in response to that. Maybe that's your strategy, right? Boom, right? And as soon as the strike comes, yeah, then it's boom. Yeah, so the again, so the again, man, say, hit you all over, something like that, right? Maybe your strategy is boom. This is okay. This is okay. The technique is irrelevant. It's the use of the footwork to set it up. And there's three important factors that go into that. There's this stability that we talk about, this tummy. It's tension in the leg, tension in the butt cheek, having the left heel in the optimal position, and having a mental connection to that. Okay, otherwise it's useless. The furikiri, the driving forward off of it to attack. Yeah, and that's the next key thing. Because what good is it if you have a nice shape but you don't use it, okay? Oh, and you can shorten that. So if you're still using that for Yeah, or Nida Waza. Okay? It can be short, it can be long, it's dynamic. So now you've not just got a dynamic use of footwork, you've got a smart use of footwork as well. And usually around the third down level, where you're doing this right foot forward semi, you now usually start to have a bit of a repertoire of different waza. So, this brings me on to my point of this person I was coaching and the breakthrough that we had. When it came to use of tame, use of kamai, this tension in the leg, and how to practically make uh, use of it, right? get the benefit out of that, okay? So, this person is that in that specific region, you're going from Nidan to Sandan. We want a strong pass, we don't just want a haphazard pass. So, what was the problem? Problem is, in Kihon, when she did the waza, everything went swimmingly. Everything went swimmingly because in Kihon there's a certain um, predetermination that you know, you're going to step in, even if you do it like semi keiko, right? You're going to step in and you're going to say, uh, say it's dekote, you practice it. Yeah? You're going to se step in and you're going to invite them in and they're going to go. So you know, you know they're going to go. And you know they're going to go straight away because they've been told to by sensei, right? Do your best, the best men, as soon as you can. Right? You're going to throw everything away at it because they want to get their, you know, they've got to get their training too. <clears throat> so, there's a certain bit of predetermination that happens there. When she got into Jikeiko, it was just this extra bit of movement before every waza. They just put it slightly behind the timing. And at first I thought, is this an issue of sem? You know, taking the initiative. But here's the thing, what was evident in Okeiko was that she always had the right waza for the situation. So if somebody was, for instance, she was deploying a semi, 
moving around and she's trying different things, but the other person was just really settled with their shin and was like, no, I'm not, I'm not really biting. Then at that point she might use a quarter man. Because you can use a quarter man like a witchy torsion, yeah? You can break their shin down and cut them in. Yeah? If they over guard the center line, it's an option for you. And so she would do it in situations like that. If she had someone who was quite jumpy, that every time you know, kind of, she made a commitment to step in, and go for the man, she would either select the push it all, or she'd select the okay. But the problem was, there was always a kind of clashing in the middle, just slightly behind the timing, where the wazza just didn't quite come off convincingly. Yeah? So I knew it wasn't necessarily sin, because everything always seemed to happen roughly when she was intending. She always chose the right waza for it. And so this got me thinking, so what is it? And what I started to notice was, there were a couple of tells. So let's say in the case of the decote, it would be sene. Yeah, if it was the case at all, it would be the sene. <laughs> this up. Okay. Initially, you might look at that and think that's kamai. And if they were sure done, you'd be right. But this person's posture is really, really clean. Yeah? They really have that nice shape. So really nice regal. They've got the shoulders, they've got the shape of the hakama, hips are nicely aligned. Really beautiful chudam. It's not the chudam. Okay? And what I realized was the problem wasn't physical, it was mental, right? So stood in the right shape, but unable to deploy it. And this got me thinking. So this is a problem of kigamai. So kigamai, for anyone who doesn't know, is the readiness of the spirit. So it's all fine and well to stand in a beautiful shape. It's useless if you can't make it work for you, right? A good case, the easier way to demonstrate this, is when you look at someone who plays Jordan, it's easy to take this posture because you think, wow, that looks, that looks really, really mean. Yeah, it looks really cool. Or for want of a lack of a term, this looks badass. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. If your Jordan is kind of meek and mild, yeah, I'm not really sure if I want to hit you. It's probably not going to be effective. Okay. But if your Jordan is kind of like, come on! Yeah then you've got a good, a good a mindset for it. Okay? You've got to take that mindset, and it's the same with Chudan, right? These principles are the same. It doesn't matter which kama you do, if it's Nito, Jodan, Chudan, the principle is the same. You need to take your concentration, your strategy, everything that you're doing in your head, right, to assail your opponent, and achieve Ippon. All of that needs to be alive in your body. You need to connect that to that back leg, okay? So to truly have tame, this tension, it's not standing there with just the feel in your body. It's, it, that should be your alertness, your, your nervousness. So everything that's going on in your mind should be alive in that leg, yeah? And in your shinai right, and in your kama. Yeah? So if my strategy from the get-go has been to stand up from Songkyo, give it loads of spirit, and apply loads of pressure and uh, take the initiative and take Shodachi Ippon with Devon Amen, right? Then that's how I should express it with my footwork. I should, this, all the energy and spirit that I'm building up in here, so, like as soon as I come up from Songkyo, that should all be literally stick your brain right in your leg, okay? So it becomes, instead of this, my shape. Same way. Yeah. Instead of that, where it's kind of detached, you have a thought and then you have to try to do it. You have a thought and then you have to try to do it. Uh, the electrical signals are just literally going like boop, 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 really slowly, right? You need to change that. This, 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 all of it, especially that, and this, and this, are one. So it becomes.
dynamic attack with commitment, full sutemi, okay, is what we're aiming to achieve with all of our wazo, yeah, and this works forwards and backwards. And the idea is, like I said, take your brain, park it in your calf muscle, and that whole posterior chain, yeah, that whole mechanism that launches you forward, that gives you that strong fukiri, that strong push off, and from there, straight forward, okay? That's what you're trying to develop. Don't let your concentration drop. So, in the beginning, at shoulder, you're building a nice shape. You're going step by step. And consequently, your level of concentration looks something like this. Seme. Strike. Oh yeah, I must remember Zonchin. Oh, reset. So the wave kind of looks like you, know, you spend quite a lot of time at the bottom where you're not really concentrating at all. You're just thinking about yourself and trying to fix yourself and make things look right. And that's okay for the level. That's okay. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's a process we all have to go through. Knee done, the concentration improves, right? So you go whoop. But there's like these still there's big dips, right? But it's kind of erratic. It's kind of like yeah, because you're so busy jumping around and stuff. But it's more fluid, and there's a little bit more time, not much more, but there's a little bit more time spent when you're actually connected. But hopefully what starts to happen from third down, it starts to settle down a little. And when you get confidence and you have that repertoire of waza, and you can start to make this mental connection yeah, between your, your body truly uh, and your intentions, um, then you're starting to get, that's usually where people are starting to hit that yodan to godan and they're start, the kendo is starting to properly change a bit into more of a mental game and hopefully all of those fundamentals should be tidied up by now by the time you pass sandan, if you're a strong pass your kendo is starting to look quite nice, it's, quite, it's looking quite sharp and now it's, you're starting to focus on the interaction uh, a, a, a lot more, okay? so, let's dial it right back down we talked about the shape of the leg and those three major components. Yeah, so you've got the shape of your leg, you've got this mental connection. What does this enable? It enables fumiki, you drive. Yeah. What else do you need for that? So you get your fumiki, as a result, you get your fumikomi, and you need your hikitsuke so that you can continue to do so. Okay, so it's like those three basic elements. So if you're IQ or your Q grade heading to shoulder, Try and break it down in those terms, okay? Think of the shape that you need, and remember what it's for. The fumikiri, the driving off, remember to pull that leg up sharply, so that you can get back in that optimum shape as quick as you can to be able to strike again, okay? What can you do to practice this and develop this? If you're in a beginner level, Suburi is the most obvious place to start. So, get your tune on Kai posture. It's important when you practice to think not just about the forward step, but the back step. So, for the forward step, make sure you're driving off that left foot. Okay? And try to avoid this. If you've got a dip in your leg, you're going to go either down, or you're going to go up. Yeah? Like this. Try to keep that head level. This leg is straight, it's not locked. Still got it, I can still bounce my leg on it if I want to. I'm carrying my hips, okay? Drive straight forward. Okay? And that stop should be quite close to how your tune on was when you set off. Okay? So each. Yeah, should be pretty close to how you set off. The next part is to think about the step back. Don't just Exaggerate, right? get rid of these visionary movements. Practice Zanshi, control after the strike. With a feeling that if I was to need to, if I were to need to do it, I would be able to instantly strike again as soon as I achieve two up. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah, the idea is that's the mental idea. So that's how you practice that mental connection. Easiest place to start. Use the room. Coming back here. Whoop. Imagine you had to immediately strike from there every time, even though you don't need to. But have that feeling, tension. You could go if you had to. Okay, so I think for anyone who's in the Q grade, certainly third Q, second Q, EQ, looking to achieve shoulder, who wants to start thinking about these kinds of concepts, that's the best place you can start to practice it. Certainly if you need one, you should be committing to your Suguri on this level. Okay? And you can do it with Renz Okawaza as well. But now for Nidon level, you really need to be strict about Hikatsuke This drawing up of the feet. So not, you can't do this anymore. Listen to the timing. One, two. Even if your shoe is fast. One, two. And that doesn't work anymore. It's got to be one, two. Yeah. Two. Yeah. And so that becomes an ensemble for doing continuous cuts. Each. Me. Sun. She. What's the timing? Each. Me. Sun. She. This kind of thing. Sharply drawing up that left foot. Or right foot if you're going back. And then you can start to deploy this in your more dynamic balance that you've achieved. And you can use it in your hikiwaza too. Because now you can do it in going in both directions. Yeah, so it comes. Yeah, so you make your hands strike. It comes to a tight situation. So that's the eye. You know, this is okay. This is where you achieve those dynamics. And that need on level. Continue to polish that towards sundown. And use it, put it under a bit of pressure by developing a nice repertoire of waza, various different waza. Now you can express that balance not just straightforward, not just two step attacks, but you can twist, okay? Pop! If you need to, you can use it with a yumiyashi, okay? Pop! You don't need to do this kind of work for Kaishido. Because you're never going to have time. Yeah, so it becomes more smooth. Okay? And by this time things are looking pretty balanced. But when you really want to make that step forward, you need to be able to apply much more uh, heavy pressure to your opponent. That's Sandan, Yondan, Godan. Uh, a lot of your kendo is going to become about assailing your opponent. Not necessarily just the strike. The strike rate goes down. The work to achieve the strike goes up. Right? And so, to test, to physically develop, going on from that knee down level, if you want to physically train this, there's a good few places you can do it. Knee down to sandan, you usually start doing these things like oi komi keiko, right? This kind of thing. You're starting to do that. Uh, what that's doing is you're continuously driving this posture forward, continuously driving those hips forward. And he gets scared. Continuously drawing that back foot up. Okay? To be able to put yourself in a position to continuously strike. That's great. Okay? It's another good fundamental one that we like to practice here. You can try. Large on the main strikes, but you do it with a feeling almost as if you're jumping. But really, yeah, it's kind of what you just did, but more strict. It looks like this. So,
trying to avoid those problems with balance. <laughs> but to be able to do it continuously, it's got to be pass the hat and he gets here. Immediately. That's why it almost looks like you're jumping. Because you're working so hard to bring that left foot up. But you're doing it with large keyhole, very strict on yourself. And you're trying to achieve a perfect two guard between each strike, even though your shin is up here towards me. So it becomes when you want that you want that finishing position. And a couple of other areas you can try. We do this drill. It's really, really handy as a man. Tai Daddy, Hiki Men. Men, Tai Daddy, Kote. Men, Tai Daddy, Hiki Do. Ski Mune, Ski Dare. Men, okay? The idea is for a lot of change in direction to test your ability to make this tension in your back leg and to be able to attack off of it immediately. So when it's slow and you learn it, it looks like this. In, tai Tai Di. In, Tai Tai Di. Got And notice when you stop, there's no fidgeting. As soon as you have the mind, you stop putting it on the That's where you go. Tai Tai Di. But when you do the drill in its entirety and you have the form, you should aim to do it like the Kadi Kegel, as much in one breath as possible and continuous without break. Okay? So it looks up something like this. And really, the most important one, that you should do this every time, is this idea of returning to Kamai with the intent of being able to immediately set off from Chudan is Kirikaish. The reason why, for most people anyway, when we train it, after the last Yoko men, you come back, you withdraw to Toma, then Seme, Isaka and Go. Because you want to practice that semi step, you don't want to do tsukiyashi where you overlap your feet. Yeah? You want to make a very tidy use of your footwork. So it becomes. Toma, semi into one step, one cut distance. And cut your mat. So try and work on. Bom, toma, no extra movement. From here, you've already got this feeling that you can attack already. So, cut, go away. Toma, perfect judo, and you can attack. So, if they step in and they were to, I don't know, step in and lift their hands, you can counter attack already from there. You have that feeling in mind, you have that kiga mind, that awareness, the zanshi. All the time, and it's in your leg, your brain is in your leg. Send it! Now you send it with focus into this one, read the mind. Yeah, and then drive with that foot. Yeah, and then on with your kick action. Yeah, then you come back here. Send it again! Oh. Yeah, on with your kick action. Yeah, oh. and again. Now if you train like this, that left leg if you're in Chudan, or your right leg if you're in Jordan, that is now your weapon. It's not this anymore. This is there just to sign the papers. Yeah? But you do your work to make your strategy work, to set up your openings, to break your opponent and actually win. You do that with your feet. 
And you do that with your body. You do that with your control of the space. That makes the opportunities. You just sign the dotted line with the shina at the end. Yeah? Okay, so that's where it's at. You can come to case then, of no matter where I am, I can now strike from anywhere. And now you can be dynamic with your kendo. There's one last drill or thing that you can do. And this is something you can do as solo practice to develop this. And you'll see this in documentaries now and again. They'll always show a high level kendoka. They're just facing a mirror, or they may be practicing with a mokujin, or something like that, you know, a uchikomidai, whatever you want to call it. You know, practice dummy. But you can do this without anything, as long as you've got space to make the attack. Yeah? You don't need to make a large attack. All you're going to do, the opponent is yourself. Get your kamai and be honest with yourself. Okay? And what you're going to try to do is attack at a timing that is unique each time. Okay? So just settle down, get that kamai, get that tension, get it live, and don't cheat. Don't move anything extra. And only you know when the timing is. Just release. And try not to hesitate. So try not to go, okay, now, and then just try to release in one. You'd be surprised how difficult this is. When you have that time at the beginning of the session where you've got your armor ready, and maybe there's still a few other people getting ready, or you're waiting for some people to arrive, it's not quite the start session, start of the, of the session, time for the start of the session, this is a good time to practice this. Just make sure you've warmed up enough to be able to do some fumikomi, some heavy committed fu fumikomi. But, that's the idea. It's like shadow boxing or something like that, right? Imaginary opponent, but only the opponent is yourself. Yep. Try to effortlessly release without hesitation. And you can do maybe 10 of these. Doesn't need to be a lot. You can do otherwise if you want. Doesn't matter, the technique itself is not really the priority, although I just suggest keeping it simple, just use men. But I think it's one of the best practices you can use uh, to just develop this mental connection to your leg. And I think consequently you'll develop really strong Dibbana Waza that way. And the good thing about strong Dibbana Waza is the very high percentage, very high percentage chance of victory. Okay? Uh, very hard to stop when people have strong Dibbana Waza. Um, and so that brings me back to this whole thing of if you want to bring your percentage of return uh, right down, so, well, right up, I should say. So maybe you do, I don't know, five attacks and two of them are ippon. That's not bad. If you do three or four attacks and two of them are ippon and shia, well, that's pretty good, yeah? So, yeah. So this, that, that's my point, basically. That's where I'm going to leave it today. So stop thinking of it as just tame and start thinking of kamai as having tame as one of its components. Why do we have tame? We have tame to be able to have something structurally to launch ourselves forward in an efficient way, in a straight line from A to B to meet our opponent head on. Okay, so that's really about efficiency. But if you ever want to make use of your tame, yeah, you need to have the other elements, of course, of your mega mind, that's fine. But if you want to be able to deploy that shape, and use it and make yourself difficult to deal with. It's the level of concentration and the mental connection between your body and your mind that needs to be seamless. You need to strive to make that seamless and you need to train like that. So when you do your saburi, when you do your kihon, when you do your mokshia, whatever it is, that's why you've got to keep a high level of concentration. You're going to make your kihon as much like your, your keiko and you know your jikeiko or your um, shiai in many ways. You've got to make it as close to that as possible. Um, but obviously respect the fundamentals. You know, keep, try to keep the best form that you can. Uh, but ultimately you need to put these things under pressure 
and you need to forge that mental connection. If you can do that, then I think it's, yeah, it's a recipe for great Kindle. So that's where we're going to park it today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please do subscribe to the channel. It really helps the channel build. And um, give it the video a like, share it, that kind of thing. And I hope you find it helpful. And these are the things I'm working on. And like I said, in six months time, I'm going to have a stab at Gordon. So if it works, I'll come back with a mentor. Right, until next time, take care guys. I'll see you soon.